Welcome, my darlings, to my humble chateau. Please make yourself very comfortable. Relax your mind and release your imagination to me. I will bring you a story to entrance and entertain. Perhaps a frightening one. Perhaps a steampunk. Perhaps a bit of mythology. Anyway, sit back. Enjoy. Enjoy. And subscribe. Snow. A steampunk fairy tale by Joy Findlay. It didn't take long for the upcoming wedding to become citywide news. The Mirror, Skyland Officials newspaper, decided another expose was in order, at Renee's request, of course. And the tower became the center of wedding preparations and breast activity. Snow graciously parked herself in the gallery next to beautifully displayed extravagant works of art. She found this amusing as she felt anything but an extravagant work of art. Glass sculptures sat on metal floors, polished to perfection, while mechanical birds pranced and chattered in golden gilded cages. While no one was watching, Snow took a pencil and quickly drew a large mustache on a painting of a cherub and sat back down again, just as Raina, the Baroness, waltzed into the room. And don't forget the large arrangements for each stand. Make sure there are no higher than the stand is tall. She was talking with a short, plump woman, the florist, who nodded her head, writing notes continuously. Raina stopped before the painting with a frown, glanced at Snow, and spun around again to the florist. That will be all, she dismissed the woman. Now, Snow, she said, looking at her gown skirts, as if talking directly to the girl who was beneath her. No more childish games, please. We have a busy schedule this week. Dress fittings, hors d'oeuvres, wine and cake testing, an interview with the press, and oh, I'm running a little behind schedule. She glanced around the room, then gave Snow a pointed look. Do not mess this up, girl. Her voice deepened into a scratch snarl. It is within my power to advise your father to send you off to boarding school. I know that St. Margaret's Academy for Girls would be much more than happy to accept your gracious application. Now, be a good girl and stay here until the press have left. But don't say a thing. She turned to meet the tailor entering the gallery with a flurry of attendants. Snow hated her, and she felt so bad for hating her. She knew her father was happy in Skyland with Raina, but Snow hated the prison and the evil woman who had built it. She wanted to scream, and she felt bad for wanting to scream. She quickly wiped away a stray tear from running down her cheek. Raina was being fitted for her wedding gown with the notable Lyon Flores. It was said he designed clothes for the royal family and was known throughout the land as a master tailor and dressmaker. His beautiful creations were exquisite. Even Snow could admit that. But she had refused Raina's suggestion that Leon Flores make a gown for Snow by pointing out that it was Raina's beautiful day, not hers. Surprisingly, Raina didn't argue saying something about it fitting that she looked inferior to her anyway. Watching the incredible Leon Flores Taylor, the beautiful dress on her soon-to-be stepmother was a wonderful experience. 
Raina stood in a circular podium that had been set up in the center of the room, while the seamstresses did Leon's bidding. Floral ivy lace was pinned over a silk bodice and skirts, then scooped around the lower back before trailing down two meters across the floor. Pearls and lilian crystals were to be sewn around every lace petal, with moonstone gems gracing the floral centers. One fitting led to another. There was more than one gown, and, and dress fitting flowed into other wedding preparations. Staff came and went. Attendants moved about the room as Raina's bidding, and a lead reporter from the mirror arrived shortly before lunch. He interviewed Raina on a chaise lounge in the adjoining room and asked her about the up-and-coming nuptials and the gowns designed by Leon Flores. He asked her about the mirror's latest artist, called the White Maid, who had been drawing images of happenings from inside the tower. But Raina cut him short, saying there was no White Maid on staff, and that certainly everything that they wrote or sketched was a fallacy. This caused Snow to smile behind her sketchbook. Then he went on to ask her about the honeymoon. Raina chose at that moment to announce that the king had called Lord Petto to the castle soon after the wedding, so there would be no honeymoon. She could neither confirm nor deny the royal request for designs and plans for a royal floating estate. But by the way she was talking, it was obvious she didn't care what the reporter wrote down for the mirror. But this was news to Snow. Her father would be leaving her? Alone? On Skyland? With Raina? Oh, this was bad. Very bad. Grabbing her sketch pad and pencil, she stood to leave the gallery. Just as the reporter entered from the side room, Raina had obviously finished with him and no longer needed him there. Miss Petto, a word, please. May I ask you a few questions for the paper? He rushed over. Snow turned to find Raina looking at her with eyes that said, Be careful what you say, young lady. She knew the drill. Keep her words light, happy, and don't say anything that would give Raina cause to harm Edison or send her off to boarding school. Certainly, was her strained reply. Miss Petto, how do you feel about the wedding of Baroness Montague and your father, Lord Petto? He asked, pencil and notebook in hand. She looked up at Raina's serious face, giving herself a moment to formulate her reply. I believe Baroness Montague makes my father very happy. We are indebted to her, was her truthful reply. Before the reporter could ask another question, the Baroness interrupted him. Moving him out of the room, it gave Snow an opportunity to escape, to find her father. Chapter 6 it was no use arguing with her father. She knew this already. She just wanted to let him know how upset she was that she had to find out from someone else of his upcoming trip instead of from him. I know, Snow, I know. I was going to tell you, but Raina insisted she tell you herself. He was trying to soothe her like she was still a child. Father, she told the reporter before I even knew anything about it, and she did that on purpose. No amount of complaining or arguing had sway with her father. He believed Raina to be a good and gracious person, not the horrible witch Snow knew her to be. If she ever told her father what Raina had done, the woman always managed to manipulate the situation around in her own defense. Snow, she probably just forgot to let you know. She's been so busy with this wedding and plans for the trip. It must have just slipped her mind. 
Oh, she screamed in frustration, swinging herself around and slumping down in an office chair. It's not fair, she said quietly to herself. I know, life's not fair, Snow. But you have lack of for nothing. You will be looked after when I'm away. And I'll leave Hunter here to manage engine maintenance while I'm gone. At Hunter's name, she smiled a sad smile. It had been many months since she had last seen her friend. She had no choice. She would be the good girl he expected her to be and try and keep out of Raina's way. I will miss you, father, she said quietly. I know, my child. I will miss you, too, he said as he wrapped his arms around her in a warm hug. I love you, Snow. Always know that. But no more of this. We have a wedding to celebrate, and I know you are going to look beautiful. He smiled down at her. And beautiful she was. Even in a simple bridesmaid's dress, her beauty still outshone all the pearls, crystals, and moonstones on Raina's gown. She duly followed the Baroness down the aisle with a bouquet of ivory gardenias, but her hair slipped from its pins at the last moment and cascaded down the back of her cream dress in a gush of freedom, much to the disdain of her new stepmother. The banquet was shrouded in bad weather, and many of the guests had to contend with rain. Snow was forced to dance with elderly gents who fancied themselves as youthful men, and she had to listen to the gossip of wealthy wives who gushed over her with renewed vigor, for each had an eligible son worth marrying. The highlight of the whole occasion was when Edison let loose and the wet shaggy dog found his way to the ballroom in the tower. Bumping over many in his wake, he charged straight towards her and leaped his muddy paws straight up onto her shoulders licking her face as she fell in a heap on the ballroom floor. Her laugh sounded a sweet song throughout the hall as she lay flat on her back with mud all over her dress. It was so worth it to see the smile on her father's face and the shock on her stepmother's. <laughs> Raina was mortified. It took two butlers and a groundsman to remove the giant dog from the room. As Hunter showed up to help her off the floor, he held out his arm in a gentlemanly manner to escort her from the crowd, as if she were not covered in giant paw prints. Once outside the room, they both ran upstairs and laughed so hard there were tears. You did that on purpose, she laughed. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. I saw how miserable you were and couldn't see any other way to bring you freedom, my lady, he said with a mock bow. Hunter, it has been too long. Thank you. You saved me from an unfortunate occasion. She smiled a sad smile at him before leaving him outside the door to her suite, shutting him out and closing her in. Chapter 7 Having said farewell to her father after the wedding banquet, Snow spent several days behind closed doors, away from her stepmother. She was drawing in her sketchbook one afternoon when Raina barged into her room. I know it's you, you wretched little rodent! How dare you! She snatched Snow's sketchbook from her hand looked at the image of Edison Snow had been drawing and threw it across the room. What are you doing? That's mine, Snow cried. Give it back, you horrible slap. Shock hit her system like never before, and tears stung her eyes. Raina had slapped her so hard across the face that pink welt marks spread instantly. She couldn't believe that someone would do that to her. What do they see in you? I made you, gave you everything, and this is how you repay me? She held up a newspaper with a sketched picture of Snow in her bridesmaid dress, 
hair trailing down over one shoulder. She looked beautiful. She took the paper and stared at the image in amazement. If I ever find you drawing this rubbish, oh, help me! I will deliver you to that boarding school faster than you can blink. She took a step into Snow's personal space, her voice scratchy and low. And if I ever see that mutt of yours again, I will have it put out of its misery. Her eyes were narrowed with fury before she turned and stormed out of the room, knocking a bedroom maid over in the process. Out of my way, she screamed. With shaking hands, Snow picked up her broken sketchbook. The maid helped her pick up the pages as she tried to cover up what was on them. But it was too late. The woman saw what she had tried to hide. Caricature pictures of various gentlemen and women, lords and ladies in various humiliating and embarrassing situations. Lord Thompson bowing low with his toupee flopping over his brow. Miss Handelman and Mrs. Tallerway slurping wine with gusto. Lord and Lady Meyer hiding silverware up their sleeves. She quickly picked up the last few sketches of an overweight Raina being fitted into a white gown while two seamstresses struggled with the bodice laces, a foot on each of Raina's rather large bottom. The maid giggled and handed the paper she collected back to Snow. These are really funny, Miss Beddo, said the maid. Please, she begged. You can't tell anyone it is me. She held her drawings to her chest, imploring the maid to keep her secret. Oh, miss, on my honor, I won't breathe a word of it. You can trust me, she said with a smile. You really are very talented, miss. This is a beautiful image she said, pointing to the newspaper article with her face on it. Oh no, that one wasn't me. I didn't draw that sketch. And she hadn't. She could lay claim to every sketch by the white maid that graced the pages of the mirror since Skyland launched five months ago. But this beautiful sketch was breathtaking. She hadn't drawn this one, but wondered who had. A porter arrived that afternoon with a letter from her father. He hadn't been grounded for long before he'd sent word that he'd been commissioned to design and build a floating castle estate for a wealthy baron and a floating kingdom for the king of Hereford. He was very excited as he wrote of the many technical details that Snow knew were for her brilliant mind only. As the letter was addressed to both her and Raina, she decided to take it to Raina's drawing room and leave it there for her. She peeked into the room and thought it empty before she slipped in quietly. She laid the letter on a tray next to a tea set carefully, only to be startled by an angry voice. You promised me fifty women and children, Raina, said a deep, husky voice. I asked for fifty according to your ledger. The paper was rustled. I got twenty-two. That is not acceptable. Do not speak to your stepsister in that tone, the Baroness's voices screeched in reply. I'm trying to run a business here. I have to deal with keeping the city afloat and keeping everyone busy. If you want another twenty-eight slaves, go get them yourself. Reyna was very angry. Snow was frozen on the spot. She couldn't believe what she was hearing. Liam, her stepmother's voice became sultry. I have been keeping up appearances and doing my part to build our empire. I've had men taking children from all over the North Provinces and moving them to the coast. But I'm doing my best. Footsteps came towards the door. Snow panicked, jumping around to find a quick escape, bumping the tea tray in the process. Teacups and saucers crashed to the floor, knocking her out of her fumbling panic as she dashed through the drawing room doors and down the hall. She thought she heard someone follow her towards the servant stairs, but by the time she crashed to the first floor service exit, she was too frightened to look back. She kept running, trying to find a place to hide, 
She ran past the local markets and past the train tracks. She passed a new fairground that was still being built and through alleyways that were too narrow for service anything. It was under a bridge near the sky dock that she finally stopped to catch her breath. Oh, goodness. Slaves? Reina is kidnapping children? She placed a gloved hand on her forehead. That was a jumble of information, and her heart a whirlpool of fear. Oh, goodness, the letter. And she knew straight away that there was no going back. She had left evidence that it was her that overheard the damning conversation. Oh, what? Oh, what am I to do now? She asked herself in the growing dusk. Chapter 8 Hours later, Snow still hadn't figured out what to do. She decided the best thing would be to approach the sky dock to catch a taxi down to the land village below. But she hadn't left her hiding place very long before someone recognized her. There were men at the Sky Dock Terminal asking after her whereabouts when someone pointed in her direction. She was on the run again, without a clue as to where to go. But she knew if those men took her back to Reina, it would be Edison's death she would have to care about. She took to the train tracks, then found a service tunnel leading off the tracks. Partway through, she found a door off the smaller tunnel that led away from her pursuers and into the belly of the city. It felt like her only way to escape. She had only been down this far underground with her father twice before. The first time to an engine room, one of three, when she saw firsthand just how large and noisy the engines were. The second trip down was with the king's entourage on the day Skylands was launched. She didn't get very far in her solo exploration when both her father and Hunter found her again and warned her from wandering off. It was awe-inspiring how big the city was underground and she'd almost got lost the second time, down until Hunter had found her. Hunter, her father, Edison, everyone she loved were so far away, and she felt so very alone and afraid. She found a darker cubby hole, many turns later, where she stopped and sat down to rest. She curled up tight with her head on her knees, and cried herself to sleep. Clang! She awoke with a start, her heart tumbling around the humid darkness that invaded her on every side. It didn't take long for her to remember where she was and what had happened. She listened again for what had startled her, only to be greeted by the natural hum of the coal engines below and vibrations of the floating city above. Moving again, she came across engineering mechanics in grease-covered overalls in the tunnels. She was sure they'd know her face, so she kept herself hidden as much as she could. She came across a large, overhanging water pipe and followed it until she found a dripping seam. Cupping her hands under the flow of water, she drank the metallic-tasting water. It was horrible, but it would keep her thirst at bay. She moved through more tunnels, avoiding people as much as possible. When she heard a loud bark from nowhere, Edison bound towards her. She fell to her knees and buried her face in his shaggy neck, holding him tight. Then she realized too late that this was probably a trap. Arms pulled her to standing as she screamed, trying to fight them off. Snow, Snow, it's me. It's Hunter. You're okay. Letting her go, hands in front to show her he was no threat to her, she placed her shaking hands over her beating heart and breathed in deeply. Oh, Hunter, you scared me. I thought she'd found me. 
She looked behind him, fully expecting armed guards. I came alone. I knew something was up when I was asked to take Edison to the pound and heard you were missing. He looked into her eyes, questions in his expression. Hunter, I overheard Raina talking about kidnapping women and children for the slave trade and... Oh, goodness, Hunter, I don't know what to do. She was almost panicking. You're telling me that the Baroness, my great-great-aunt, is an illegal slave trader? He asked in disbelief. Snow took a step away from the young man. You have to believe me. She manipulated everyone and everything. And now with my father away on business, she has no reason to keep me here. She was pleading with him to believe her, but knew it was useless. Snow, listen to yourself. He stepped towards her, retreating form. Raina might be a vindictive woman, but she's very wealthy and very influential. These kind of claims could get you thrown in court. It was obvious he didn't believe her. She tried to recall the details of the conversation she overheard in Raina's drawing room and got frustrated when she couldn't remember it all. She called him Lori or Lamb or something. Liam! She called him Liam! She whispered rather loudly. Up until that point, Hunter hadn't believed her story. Up until she said Liam's name. Liam? Are you sure? He asked her. Yes, Liam! He was really angry with her, Hunter. She saw the worried look on his face. Hunter? Liam is Raina's brother, stepbrother, I believe. He's my great-great-uncle once removed or something. But he's a nasty piece of work. He closed the gap between them and took her hand. You couldn't have known about him, Snow. I believe you, but if he's involved, then you are in grave danger. Well, that's comforting. Sarcasm becoming the better of her. We have to get you out of here. Off Skylands and away from Raina. He looked down at her dress and realized that might not be so easy in what she was wearing. The sky docks are flooded with Raina's men. I tried. It won't work. But I need something to eat. She looked up at him. How did you find me? It was a sudden thought. I'm Hunter. It's what I do. The same line he'd given her every time she got lost. It also might have something to do with Edison and his big fat nose, but uh, he stepped back holding his nose. That might have something more to do with how you smell, he said with a grin as she slapped him on the arm. So quoth this raven. My darlings, obviously I am still struggling to get through this cold. But um, I have stories lined up and ready. And I should have one up for you Tuesday. I certainly hope. So I hope you've enjoyed this little story. Go read more of Joy Findlay's stuff. She has a whole bunch of these wonderful steampunk fairy tales. Give this video a like. Share it if you'd prefer. And if you comment, I will do my best to comment back. I love and appreciate you all, my darlings. Subscribe and ring the little bell if you have not done so, so you know when to come up and see me. And I will see you next time. <laughs> Farewell.